go uh, will be available. We're now joined by defensive coordinator Golding. Uh, we'll go ahead and take questions. We'll begin with uh, Christopher Heidel. Christopher. Good morning, Coach. Uh, thanks for giving my uh, taking my uh, my question this morning. Uh, Justin Fields, uh, you guys probably didn't you saw him probably in 2018. What does he look like today when he was just a freshman in 2018? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think he looks much more veteran. Um, I think he does a good job of getting them in and out of plays. Uh, obviously, they're a big check with me team. Uh, and based on the shell in the front, he can control the run game and the pass game. So I think uh, he's come a long way, obviously, of understanding coverages and fronts and how they fit together. Uh, and he does a really nice job getting them in and out of plays. Uh, obviously, I think he's got a really good arm, a uh, really strong arm. Another one, you know, he threw on his back foot 68 yards last week for the touchdown. Uh, but I think his accuracy has improved. Um, I think he's done a better job of, you know, keeping his feet in the pocket and keeping his eyes downfield, but he still has the ability to be able to hurt you and tuck it and run. Uh, so I really think he's become a complete quarterback, not labeled as an athlete. Uh, I think he can make the throws, uh, can make the checks, understands coverages. So uh, I think he's really grown up. Coach, we'll go next to Ralph Russo. Go ahead, Ralph. Hey, Coach. Um, along those lines, you know, uh, Coach Saban was mentioning that you know Ryan Day is a very good play caller. Um, what does that mean to you? What are some of the things as far as play callers that um, that are that could put stress on your defense? And what, if anything, that you've seen from Ryan on film makes him good at it? Yeah, I think uh, I think he really does a really nice job of. Um, manipulating things by formation. Um, I think a lot of formation into the boundary, they'll shift their motion, uh, do a lot of different things out of the same personnel grouping. Uh, he does a really nice job moving guys around uh, in certain spots and isolating guys and trying to get them on a linebacker or get them on a safety. Um, I think they do a really nice job in the run game of creating the extra gap, uh, making you account for the quarterback. Uh, but I, I really like their look system. You know, so I mean, they're in the right play a lot of the times based on looking to the sideline and checking the play. And then they complement that with a fake look. And then now they go tempo off of it uh, to where you're kind of caught in the middle. Hey, can I look to the sideline, be able to check what we're in? And then now they snap the ball. You're not ready and it's an explosive. Or you're saying, hey, here's what we're in. Here's my hand. You know, are we either better than you or we're not? And I think he's done a really nice job of complementing those two things uh, and staying pretty balanced with it. And then mix in the tempo game on top of that, you know, to where they'll create an explosive play and then they'll hurry up and then now they'll hurry up and they snap it and go. And then they'll go hurry up, kill, kill, kill. What are you in? Let's call the right play. Here's two high, here's a quarters beater. You know, let's run double post and, and take the shot. So I think he, obviously a lot of things complement each other, you know, in the look, in the run game, in the pass game. And based on what you're in, they've got the best play, you know, for that front in a run game or for that coverage in the pass game. Uh, so I think you got to do a really nice job of changing that up. But he, yeah, he does a really nice job. Next, we'll go to Dan Hope. Go ahead, Dan. Hey, Pete, you guys, and, you know, your two, the two best offenses you face this year, Ole Mess had 48 and Florida had 46. So just wondering how much does that concern you going into a game against Ohio State? And what do you think of a thing you guys have can do better than maybe you did in those games? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is fundamental execution. You know, I mean, I don't think we ever come out of a game looking up how many points was given up or how many we keep them to. You know, I think there were several games to where, you know, we kept them low in scoring, but it still didn't execute. They just didn't take advantage of it. You know, so I think the biggest thing is going in is evaluating ourselves and the things that we've got to be able to clean up and execute the individual jobs within all 11 and then collectively get all on the same page. Uh, so I think the biggest thing on teams like this that go tempo, that are multiple, is having all 11 guys on the same page with their cleats on the turf, and you got to be able to play, and you got to make them execute, and you got to be able to contest every play. I think, you know, a lot, of, a lot of their chunk plays, you know, come up in the run game when there's a gap short because the guy misfit it or they weren't set, they weren't ready because of the tempo with it. And you can't give these guys those plays. They're going to make enough contested plays because they got a really lot, of, really lot of good players at a lot of spots. 
to where you got to contest everything. And we got to be sound in the run game. Uh, you know, we got to try to stay ahead of the chains, put them in obvious pass and downs because they're really, I mean, they're, they're really balanced. And they do a really nice job in multiple different down and distance of staying balanced based on what you're in. Uh, so obviously games like this, obviously from a mental area standpoint, you know, they got to be small in number. We got to do a great job attacking the line of scrimmage up front, trying to control the run game, be gap sound. And then you got to tackle in space. You know, they're going to create some matchups in space uh, to where we got to get them on the ground. And we got to be able to play well on first and second down uh, to get them in third and long situations, make it obvious passing downs. Because uh, I think that's one thing you looked at, whether it's Florida, Ole Miss, or even a couple times last week versus Notre Dame. You've got some opportunities on second and seven to ten to make them third and eight, third and tens, third and elevens. You miss a tackle in the backfield. You get a penalty. You look up. Now it's third and two, third and three, third and one. And you got five of those. And then those are hard to stop. And so then they move the chains, and now they got another set, and here we go. Uh, so I think we got to do a great job on first and second down by controlling the line of scrimmage, tackling well in space, being on the same page, and then you've got to execute on third down. You've got to be able to get off the field. Coach, we'll next go to Nathan Baird. Go ahead, Nathan. Pete, sorry about that. Um, Good. Ohio State used its tight ends in the passing game a lot early this season and then for about two months didn't throw to them really at all. And then obviously last week they were a, a, a big red zone threat. So I guess just as a the guy who's trying to to scheme against that, how do, how do you approach that going into a game where a team is, has kind of shown a strength there but also has also kind of ignored it at times? Well, I also think it kind of goes back into, you know, we're talking about him as a play caller or what are they giving him? You know, I think they do a nice job based on what you're in and what they need to attack. And they're going to try to attack that one-on-one -on -one matchup. You know, so I think, you know, lately people have been trying to take, hey, let's take two out the game, let's take five out the game. Well, then now you're isolated one-on-one -on, -one on a bigger body, and a lot of that's in the red zone. Uh, so I think you got to do a great job of changing that up. you got to change the pitcher. Uh, you got to change who you're doubling, if you're doubling, all that. But, I mean, I think the big piece, you got to count for them all. Because just like you said, there are several games where they don't, they don't have a reception. And then, you know, the next two games they come and they get in that red area and they target them uh, and they do a nice job with them. So they got a lot of weapons. I mean, I think it's, this is a game that you go in and say, hey, I just stopped this guy, we're going to win the game. That's not the case. Uh, they're very multiple. They got a lot of good players at multiple spots uh, that you got to defend. Uh, so you got to do a lot of different pitchers, show them different things and play different coverage variables to be able to take away certain things at certain times. Which will next go to Stephen Means. Stephen, go ahead with your question. Hey, Coach, when you're preparing for Trey Sermon, it's almost been night and day versus what he's been the last month versus what he was for basically the entire season. So I don't know how far back in the film you guys go, but are, are you at all like, perplexed on what Trey Sermon might show up on Monday? Oh, I mean, I think we'll get his best. I mean, we normally get everybody's best, and I think he's playing at a really high level. Uh, I think he runs the ball effectively. He runs behind his pads. I think he's explosive. I think he does a nice job understanding their blocking structure up front uh, and follows blockers and has patience when he needs to. Uh, but he's one of those guys where you give him the seam, he can take it. You know, I think he's got breakaway speed. Uh, and then he still has the ability to catch some out of the backfield. So I think he's playing at a really high level. I, I think we'll get his best on Monday. Um, obviously, I think they're going to give it to him a fair amount. And we got to do a great job of running our feet on contact uh, and peppering the ball here and getting 11 guys to the ball because uh, he's a really good player and they got a good front to block for him. Next question comes from John Zener. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Pete, um, Dylan Moses obviously kind of opened up on social media about some of the things he's gone through this season. Um, could you tell, did, did y'all have some talks early in the season that, that he was going through some adversity and and um, and how much has he progressed as a, on the field as the season's gone on? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, don't, shit, I think we all have gone through some adversity this year, you know. Um, but no, I think like any young player coming in and going through this year and having, you know, some things from a family standpoint, like we, a lot of us had this year, you know, with some deaths on the family, stuff like that, that it was hard, you know, and, and I think he, you know, he fought through it. Uh, when he was in this building every day, he locked in, had the ability to focus. Uh, I think that shows his maturity and him growing up and, and him being a senior this year and coming back for that fourth year. Uh, so it never became a distraction to where you were ever like on the field or what, what's wrong with Dylan. It wasn't that by any means. 
You know, I think that was kind of him just letting everybody else know, hey, some of the best players in the country go through the same things that everyday people do. And you got to be able to fight through it and push through it. And, you know, at the end of it, you're going to be appreciative that you did that. And I think it was more of that line of him trying to kind of use that as a lesson for our young guys uh, than it was really him saying, hey, I can't handle this or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, obviously we've had several talks. Uh, he's a great kid, and I'm proud of the way he's fought through it this year and battling injuries and everything else. So he's done a really nice job of that. And I think that's the one thing, obviously, I've been most impressed with is when he's here, he's in the building, he's on the field, he's locked in. All right, let's bring people with you. Uh, obviously, we got to practice well to play well. And, and there hasn't been any of that, you know, from a senior standpoint. I'm a little banged up. I can't go out and practice. That, that's not who he is. Uh, so I appreciate him for that. And next, we'll go to Joseph Goodman. Go ahead, Joe. Hey, Dad, what's the big takeaway? Uh, what, what was the big takeaway from the Ole Miss game? And what, what from that game still applies for this game coming up? Right? Yeah, I mean, I think two things to me. I mean, obviously, you can go through that game and get a lot of things. But, you know, yards after contact, which is every game. I mean, there's 250 yards after somebody made contact with the guy that had the ball. Uh, I mean, that's, that's tough to win at any level when you do that. That comes up missed tackles, poor angles, not getting 11 guys to the ball. Uh, I think we had 28 mental errors in that game as well. Um, obviously, not getting all 11 guys on the same page. Uh, some of that you look back on, all right, from a call perspective, uh, where there are too many options based on a formation or something like that, to where when tempo gets involved, uh, that they're not on the same page and we're not contesting plays. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is, is locking in and being able to focus and dominate my box and do my job. I think there's certain games where people start scoring and you're not having success that certain guys try to press and they try to start making plays that aren't theirs. And then they, they fast flow over the top and they got the backside A gap and well now it cuts back and now it's an explosive run. Uh, and it's not that they didn't know they had it. It was just that they're pressing and trying to make a play for the team. But in turn, you know, it ends up hurting the team. Uh, so I think our guys have matured in that saying, hey, do my job. My plays are going to come. When they come, I need to make them. And then going back on those things that we didn't do well, showing them on tape, all right, now how, why and how can we correct it? And then putting them in that environment in a practice situation, whether it's a drill, what have you, all right, to be able to correct that and they know and get that muscle memory from it uh, so we can prevent it from happening again. So I think all those are good teaching moments uh, for young players. But the bottom line in this game, you've got to be able to tackle well in space and you've got to stay ahead of the chains. That's what the offense is trying to do. You've got to get them in obvious passing downs. But then when you do that, you've got to be able to execute and get off the field. And we've got to do a better job of creating turnovers. You know, obviously, I think when you hold people to where not they're used to scoring, same thing when you look at Ohio State, they're averaging 43. And when they don't, it's because they've turned the ball over. It's not because people stopped them. All right? It's because they've made a mistake. People made them make mistakes, and they made them pay for it. And they got off the field, whether it be a turnover on third down. So I think that's the critical piece of this game. Take one final question from Dennis Dodd. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah. Um, hey, Pete. Um, the the Northwestern game stands out so much in, in Ohio State's season. Would you would you reach out to them to talk to them? And can you give an example, maybe, of in your career where you've done something like that? I mean, coaches talk to each other all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I think. And anything, it's a copycat business. What do people do well that's working? And obviously, you want to move to your business, obviously, to make it successful. So, I mean, I think the first thing is evaluating the tape. You know, how similar are they to us on defense? Obviously, because what they do in a run game and a pass game is going to be dictated on what you do. Uh, so, obviously, a lot of that, some of the things don't marry because defensively, sometimes we're different than other people. Uh, but conceptually of going in and trying to take things away and how you do it, obviously, yeah, we study just like any student does. You know, this is our profession. We want to be the best at what we do. Uh, so most of that comes up in the off season, obviously, in the summers when you're doing your studies uh, and finding certain things that are better versus certain, obviously, runs and passes and how we can change things up. But, yeah, obviously, you look at everything, you know, and look at, all right, what do they do well? You know, who's done a good job of stopping the bread and butter? How did they do that? 
All right, well, what do we have within our scheme that is that? All right, so obviously we're not coming up with something new that our kids aren't familiar with and don't have a lot of bank reps in, and then now we screw that up because you don't have, obviously, the bank reps and the practice to do it. But what within our scheme is similar to that that was effective? And then obviously they're going to have a compliment off of that, just like we do. We screw something up. We've got a mental error. Well, then Monday we're fixing it because we know the next opponent is going to do the same thing. They're going to go through our explosive reels. All right, what big plays did we give up? Why? All right, well, they're going to do the same thing. I mean, we see that every week in the openers. That we're going to see plays that this team's never ran that have hurt us throughout the year or previous years that people go copycat, put into their scheme to obviously try to, you know, identify the weakness of a defense and exploit it. So, absolutely, both sides of the ball do that. All right, Coach Golding, thanks for your time. We'll see you in Miami. Appreciate it. Thank you all.